a very good evening aspirants welcome to hindu news analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy today is 19th of january 2022 we have an announcement today shankar ias academy has designed a refresher course called as csat plus some aspirants though they score good marks in gs paper in preliminary exam they find it very challenging to qualify in the civil service aptitude test paper shortly called as csat paper so to help students to easily qualify for the csat shankar ias academy has come up with this course which starts on 27th of january 2022 the class time will be from 5:30 pm to 8 pm the program is also available in online mode the admission is open now and by joining one will get these benefits complete overview of csat course shortcuts for time management and accuracy topus interaction strategy to improve and manage the english skills to understand the question and previous year csat paper analysis dear aspirants kindly use this wonderful opportunity to register for the program visit the link given in the description below see the list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen the first topic is schools without freedom here we are going to discuss how the education should be decentralized for higher productivity among children see here we have discussed some important points which you can use for your gs papers as well as for the essay and the second topic is regarding smog towers here we have discussed about smog and the types of smog which is photochemical smog and sulfurous smog this is important in prelims perspective and the third topic is regarding the silver line project which is a semi high speed railway project in kerala here we have discussed how the society is affected by the infrastructure projects here also we have discussed some of the key main points which you can use for your mains answers and the fourth and fifth topic is regarding nclat and national commission for women that is ncw see nclat and ncw has been constantly in news in the last couple of months so we have intentionally taken these topics to discuss in prelims perspective so without wasting much time let's start our discussion friends look at this article this article is taken from the text and context page it talks about the importance of freedom for schools especially government schools so that they could have some autonomy this is the crux of this article so let's discuss this article in detail the syllabus relevant for this article is given here for your reference kindly go through it see the reason for choosing this article is that the topic education has very wide scope the points regarding this article can be used in all your gs papers as well as for your essay now coming back to the article see due to the extended lockdown the learning poverty in india is expected to increase from 55 percentage to 70 percentage why this is due to learning loss and more out of school children now we will understand this keyword what is learning poverty means see according to the world bank learning poverty is defined as the percentage of 10 year old children who cannot read and understand a simple story see if you are a 10 year old child you should be studying in your 4th uh, or 5th standard right you are reading a story and you cannot even read or understand what is said in that story which means you are suffering from learning poverty okay now let's see what are all the issues that are leading to increase of this learning poverty see the state of children's education is dependent on many local factors what are these factors they are quality teachers and quality principals then transportation facilities and health care facilities and another most important factor is that the whole district in which the school belongs okay but our structure is such that the central and state authority boards who are responsible to make a decision are not prioritizing these local factors note that education comes under the concurrent list which means both state and union government can make laws but the decentralization did not touch the core aspects of education as a system see the principals and teachers from both the government run schools and private schools are carving for autonomy why the autonomy is needed because those serving in government run schools need to strictly follow the rule book which has no provision for freedom to make decision based on these local factors and take the case of the private schools 
where the principals and teachers are controlled by the school owners and managers thus the major issue here is the centralized decisions in the form of orders and circulars issued by the directorate and the examination board because they do not take into account the professional knowledge and experience of the principal and teachers who are well aware of the local factors in which the children's education system depends now take the situation during the covid pandemic see india has over 6 lakh villages which are diverse diverse in the sense it is diverse in geography economics health standards and facilities so the impact of covid 19 also has to vary right so our way of approach to control the spread must also vary according to the diversity which is well known to the locals see any known person of you may be studying in school see consider in your area the impact may be very low but still he or she may not attend the school because the state or central government may have announced holiday for all now take this case study see a tribal panchayat in kerala edamalakudi has zero covid cases until the second wave this was because of the self imposed lockdown vigil of local tribal communities against the entry of outsiders and the lifestyle of the people especially consumption of locally grown produce now again consider the situation of all schools which are asked to stay closed during the pandemic do you think all the schools need to be closed obviously not right see the solution to this would be to give schools the autonomy to make decision depending on varying local factors for example if village schools were given autonomy many would have found local conditions good enough to allow children to come for their meals and spend some quality time in studying note that not all learning has to occur in the classroom focusing on foundational literacy and numeracy will definitely improve educational quality see a child in his or her formative stages needs opportunity to observe natural phenomena and represent it in different forms and analyze it see formative stage is a stage where they learn more quickly than any other time in their life see the village teachers can bring great energy by encouraging children to spend time outdoors for assigned observation for example children may be asked to observe the migration of butterflies and the children who have acquired a smartphone can share their observed recordings right thus stressing the children with the online classes may seem like a technological upgradation in education but it is not actually true see many schools in india don't even possess a magnifying lens or binoculars or microscopes for study purpose and they are also technological tools right thus i would like to conclude my discussion with a few thought provoking points see decision making should always involve the people who will have direct benefit of that decision why because only then the decision will yield benefit otherwise it will have negative impact more than the positive impact so by giving autonomy and professional competence to teachers and principals along with their guidance of community boards of that particular district in which the school belongs we can prevent the loss of imagination and talent of our young brains that is children as a result of such basic freedom the indian education system can enrich the nation with great imaginative and creative citizens so that's all regarding this article utilize the points discussed to enrich your main answers now let's move on to our next discussion friends look at this news article it provides insights into the efficacy of the smart tower installed in new delhi so before discussing the article let us brush up some basics about smart and its harmful effects The syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it see basically smog is an air pollution that reduces visibility it is a combination of various gases with water vapor and dust a large part of these gases is produced when fuels are burnt so initially the term smog was first used to describe a mixture of smoke and fog and this smoke usually came from burning of coal therefore initially smog was common only in industrial areas but now we can find smog predominantly in cities also why this is due to other factors such as emission from motor vehicles and power stations temperature and wind condition 
एक्सेट्रा सी दिक्चर हिय द रईट वन शो इंडिया गेट फील्ड वित् स्म अरउंड इट हियर द स्ट्रक्चर आफ इंडिया गेट इज हेसी दट इज इट्स विसिबिलिटी इज अफेक्टेड बै स्म बट हौ इज स्म फॉर्म See smog forms when heat and sunlight react with the gases released and with fine particles in the air and depending on the gases smog can be of two types one is photochemical smog and the other is sulfurous smog see photochemical smog is produced when the gases are nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compound that is voc see there is a trap here it is not sulfur oxides or carbon dioxide it is nitrogen oxides kindly read the statement twice when asked in preliminary examination now coming back to the discussion this volatile organic compound are compounds that have a high vapor pressure and low water solubility but they are emitted as gases only so volatile organic compounds are emitted from certain solids or liquids such as paints cleaning supplies pesticides etc and nitrous oxides come from car exhaust coal power plants and factory emissions so when the sunlight reacts with this nitrous oxide and volatile organic compound in the atmosphere it results into a smog which we called as photochemical smog the term photochemical is used here because the smog is the result of chemical action of light now since photochemical smog requires light this smog tends to occur more often in summer when we have the most sunlight therefore photochemical smog is also called as summer smog and it is also called as los angeles smog because in 1943 a severe photochemical smog incident happened in los angeles see this smog is harmful because the reaction forms airborne particles and ground level ozone and this airborne particles affect the lungs and health of the people See the ground level ozone is also harmful because when ozone is close to the ground it can also damage lung tissue it can cause itchy burning eyes and other diseases now what about sulfurous smog see sulfurous smog is formed when the gas involved is sulfur oxide when there is a high concentration of sulfur oxides in the air in the form of sulfur dioxide it results in sulfurous smog additionally its other main constituent is soot plus It also has large quantities of fly ash, sodium chloride and calcium sulfate particles. Now the high sulfur oxides are caused by the use of sulfur bearing fossil fuels particularly the coal with high sulfur content. So this smog appears in industrial areas and because of this it is also called as industrial smog or black smog. It is called black smog because This smog contains large number of tiny aerosol particles that make it appear grey and this type of smog is associated with low temperatures and high humidity so it appears mainly in cold climate why because in winter the wind speeds are low so it causes the smoke and fog to stagnate this leads to high smog near ground level this characteristic is what led to the great smog of london in 1952 because the smoke from industries clubbed with the winter caused sulfurous smog which led to 4000 deaths in london and due to this reason the sulfurous smog got its name as london type smog or london smog see it resulted in the deaths because of the harmful nature of this smog see when sulfur oxides is in high concentration it reacts with atmospheric hydroxide and they produce sulfuric acid which will precipitate as acetate additionally sulfur dioxide also causes health issues like respiratory irritations so these are the basics about the smog you should know now from the discussion you would have understood that delhi gets affected by sulfur smog because it is the result of smoke from industries and stubble burning and mainly this happens in winter this smog affected health of the people so supreme court intervened and ordered the delhi government to take steps to mitigate it and one such step was the installation of smog tower see the smog tower is a large scale air cleaning system or large scale air purifier so it basically filters the air of pollutants when polluted air pass through it and then it releases the clean air to the environment see in august 2020 delhi government installed smog towers in the city so it has functioned for more than 5 months therefore it was expected that air pollution conditions would have reduced in delhi but the news today is that it did not happen 
and air quality monitoring done by a private party has revealed that there are fluctuating levels of pm 2.5 pollutant and even near the tower air was not found to be clean that is air was not found to be free of air pollutants in several instances but contrastingly pollution levels were comparatively lower if one moved away from the tower so it was concluded that air quality around smog tower has no steady improvement due to this experts are criticizing the smog tower installation and asking the government to invest in other measures to reduce air pollution and that's all regarding this article see we have seen about smog which is a air pollution that reduces visibility and it is a mixture of smoke and fog then we have seen the types of smog that is photochemical smog and sulfur smog see when sunlight reacts with nitrous oxides and volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere it results in photochemical smog and it occurs more often in summer therefore photochemical smog is also called as summer smog and it is otherwise known as los angeles smog then we saw about sulfur smog when there is a high concentration of sulfur oxides in the air in the form of sulfur dioxide etc it results in sulfur smog and since this smog appears in industrial areas it is also called as industrial smog or black smog and it mainly occurs in cold climate it is otherwise known as london smog and that's all regarding this article discussion now we will move on to the next article friends look at this editorial article this editorial talks about kerala's silver line project the author of this editorial feels that this project will do more harm to the environment than the declared benefits so in our discussion we will focus on the issues with the project and some alternatives to the project see here the project is related to kerala but the issues we are going to discuss today in this article is almost happening in every part of the country so you can use these points in the railway related questions or any infrastructure related questions in your mains answer so that's why we have chosen this article the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference just go through it now let's start our discussion see first let us discuss about the silver line project see the silver line project involves building a semi high speed railway corridor through kerala the silver line aims to link kerala's southern end and the state capital tiruvananthapuram with its northern end of kasaragod the railway line is proposed to be 529.45 km long covering 11 district through 11 stations see the current travel time between kasaragod and tiruvananthapuram on the existing indian railway network is 12 hours but once the project is completed one can travel from kasaragod to tiruvananthapuram in less than 4 hours on trains traveling at 200 km per hour and this 64000 crore project is a joint venture between kerala government and the union ministry of railways see the project if completed the government claims these benefits firstly the route that we saw already has a railway line connecting it but the real problem is that it has a lot of curves and bends so the average train speed is 45 km per hour and this is a relatively low speed ride so this is why currently it takes 12 hours to travel from kasaragod to tiruvananthapuram and if the silver line project is implemented the travel time can be massively reduced secondly this project will help decongest the road see consider many people travel by this railway line this will is crowding of roads and pulling private vehicles from the roads so the air quality can be improved and the greenhouse gas emission can be reduced there will be a substantial reduction in road accidents due to decongestion on roads silver line also provides last mile connectivity which will transform people's perception towards public transportation see the silver line project will have a lower noise impact than highway traffic hence noise pollution can be reduced thirdly the land acquisition in the case of silver line project will be easy when compared to highway connecting northern and southern kerala because highway projects consist of four lanes and connecting kasaragod and tiruvananthapuram the amount of land acquisition would be higher compared to the land acquisition required for the silver line project so what we can understand is that in case of highway project the land acquisition is also difficult and money also has to be spent more now coming to the next benefit the government claims that 
this project is necessary for absorbing the future growth in traffic see the feasibility study conducted for the project estimated that nearly 80000 people are expected to travel per day through this semi high speed rail daily by 2025 to 26 this is the time the project is expected to be completed and it is also expected that around 160000 people will travel through this semi high speed rail network by 2052 to 2053 so the government feels while satisfying the future requirement for connectivity the increased ridership will also make the project financially viable and finally if the project is completed it will produce employment opportunities friends any infrastructure project will provide this employment opportunity this project will integrate airports and it corridors and enable faster development of cities it passes through it will also provide necessary impetus to the tourism industry of kerala see although government claims these benefits of the project various sections of the people are opposed to it so now let us see the various issues associated with the project see as i said before these issues can be used in your main answer relating to any infrastructure project especially with respect to railways now the first issue is that financial viability of the project see when the project was proposed the estimated cost was around 64000 crores but recently the niti ayog indicated that the actual cost of the project will be around rupees 126000 crores see we know that kerala is one of the densely populated states in india so obviously land acquisition will be difficult so it would be a mammoth task to complete the project by 2025 and if the project is delayed there will be a cost overruns over and above the niti ayog estimated cost of rupees 126000 crore and this might make the project unviable now the second issue is that the activists claim that the government estimate on ridership is false and there is no proper data to support the government claim see the government has said that the fare on the silver line project will be rupees 2.75 per kilometer but this figure is based on the estimated cost of rupees 64000 crore see we already saw that the actual cost of the project will be well above the niti ayog estimate this means that the government will have to raise the cost to rupees 4 per kilometer in order to break even and this increased cost will make the project unaffordable for the common people see if common people don't use this railway network it will be a massive failure and due to the high cost people will choose to travel in the already existing railway line connecting kasaragod and tiruvananthapuram See already Indian Railways is planning to run all express trains at 150 kilometers per hour by 2025. So in 2025 if normal trains are available at a speed of 150 kilometers per hour why will the common people that is the middle class people travel in this semi high speed train it runs at a average speed of 180 kilometers per hour which is just 30 kilometers over the normal train but the issue is that the ticket rate is 10 times higher than the normal train fare so this project might end up being a money draining vanity project thirdly the government claims that through the operationalization of semi high speed trains powered by renewable energy the state can reduce the carbon dioxide emission in a year by 287994 tons See this claim of the government is also challenged by the critics of the project. The critics claim that by 2030 the union government aims to make India a 100% electric vehicle nation. So by 2030 if at least 50% of motor traffic is electrified it will considerably bring down carbon dioxide emission. Hence silver line won't have that added advantage when it materializes. and the fourth issue is the very important issue which is the displacement of people see the land which is required for this project is around 60000 acres 60000 acres in the sense 3500 acres for the tracks and station and another 2500 acres for the proposed 10 smart cities and other commercial complexes nearby the proposed stations see from a rta reply we came to know that 9314 buildings will have to be destroyed for the project and 10000 families will be needed to be relocated however according to metroman e sridharan the number could go 
as high as 20000 that is 20000 families will need to be relocated so this human displacement will have a negative social impact and finally comes the issue of environment see we all know that kerala is a land defined by its water bodies so the integrity of kerala's natural landscape is crucial to mitigate the disasters see after the recent floods that kerala has been facing the lesson learnt is that any infrastructural development should provide room for rivers here the idea is not to obstruct rivers and give water enough space to flow so that it does not invade residential areas that is the water should not enter our homes see according to reia that is rapid environment impact assessment of the total 530 kilometers of the project 80 percentage would include embankments see embankment is nothing but a wall or bank of earth or stone built to prevent a river flooding an area so these embankments will naturally obstruct water flow and the movement of people further the report adds that the project passes through 164 spots which are declared as hydrological environmental impact zones so with climate change and global warming kerala might face more climate related hazards in near future and this project will only amplify these hazards now we have done with the issues associated with the project so we will see the alternatives for the project see the cheapest and most affordable alternative is fixing the railway infrastructure that already exist see the main reason for slow average speed in the already existing railway infrastructure is due to numerous curves if the indian railways can fix the curves on existing lines then the normal train can run at enhanced speed so this will also bring down the travel time right and if silver line if fully implemented will add to the burden of the state this in turn would burden the citizens who have to pay for the project one way or the other for the next 35 years so the author of this editorial claims that the two extremities of the states are already connected by road and rail so this light rail built at an astronomical cost is not at all necessary even when it promises to save some travel time and the public money can be used to generate power supply based on green energy it can be also used for the provision of safe drinking water and urban sewerage and for building infrastructure for the scientific disposal of waste see according to the author of this article investing in the above mentioned projects will solve the pressing needs that kerala is facing today also investing in these project will have high social returns and contain progressive environmental degradation in kerala now we have come to the end of the discussion in this segment we saw about kerala's silver line project the benefits claimed by the government the issues in the project which is highlighted by the critics and the issues includes land acquisition displacement of people and environmental issues we have also discussed some viable alternatives for the project with this learning let us conclude the discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article see actually twin star technologies a company promoted by vedanta group of companies chairman anil agarwal has made a financial bid for a group of companies the nclat that is the national company law appellate tribunal has set aside the bid made by twin star technologies and invited a fresh bid so twin star technologies has challenged the order of the nclat and approached the supreme court this is the crux of this news article So in this discussion let us revise about NCLT and NCLAT first let us take NCLT see NCLT is a quasi judicial authority and NCLT is formed to deal with corporate disputes that are of civil nature arising under the companies act see the central government has constituted national company law tribunal that is NCLT under section 408 of the companies act of 2013 note that nclt works on the lines of a normal court of law in our country the nclt is obliged to be fair and it must act without any bias it must decide matters in accordance with the principle of natural justice now what are the functions of nclt firstly the insolvency and bankruptcy court 2016 recognizes nclt as the adjudicating authority for the purpose of insolvency resolution 
and liquidation for corporate persons kindly note here that the nclt deals with insolvency of only corporate persons then who will deal with the insolvency proceedings of individuals and partnership firms it is carried out by debt recovery tribunals kindly note this point for the preliminary examination secondly the nclt has the authority to decide on cases pending before the board for industrial and financial reconstruction the nclt also has authority to decide on cases pending under the sick industrial companies act of 1985 finally nclt deals with proceedings under the companies act such as arbitrations arrangements compromise reconstruction and winding up of company now having discussed the functions let's see the composition of nclt it consists of a president and such number of other judicial and technical members as may be prescribed see the president of the tribunal will be appointed by the central government after the consultation with the chief justice of india and the members of nclt are to be appointed by the central government on the recommendation of a selection committee see the president of nclt should be or has been a judge of a high court for 5 years These are some important points about NCLT now let us see some points about NCLAT that is the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal see the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal was constituted under the section 410 of the Companies Act of 2013 and it was constituted with the purpose of hearing appeals against the orders of NCLT under the Companies Act that is it functions as a appellate tribunal now what is this appellate tribunal it means a special court or committee or tribunal that is formed to reconsider a decision made by another court or committee or tribunal it is basically to reconsider a decision made by other courts right okay it also functions as the appellate tribunal for hearing appeals against the orders passed by NCLT under the IBC Act of 2016 then it is also the appellate tribunal for hearing appeals against the orders passed by insolvency and bankruptcy board of india under section 202 and section 211 of IBC kindly note that it is also the appellate tribunal under the competition act of 2002 and this is as per the section 410 class 2 of companies act and 53a of the companies act 2002 so it hears and disputes of the appeals against the directions decisions orders passed by the competition commission of india but note that if any person is not satisfied with the orders of nclat they can appeal to the supreme court within 60 days from the date of receipt of the order of nclat so this is why we saw in the news that twin star technologies has challenged the orders of nclat and approached the supreme court having done with the functions of nclat let us see the composition of nclat see it consists of a chairman and judicial and technical members having a tenure of 5 years and the chairman shall be a former or incumbent judge of supreme court or the chief justice of a high court we saw that the tribunal also has technical members right see here the technical members must possess special knowledge in industrial finance industrial management industrial reconstruction investment and accountancy and the technical member should also have a professional experience of not less than 25 years here note that the chairman and judicial members are appointed after the consultation with chief justice of india whereas the technical members are appointed on the recommendation of a selection committee consisting of cji or her nominee a senior judge of supreme court or chief justice of high court and secretaries to the ministries of corporate affairs and law and justice now let us conclude this discussion in this discussion we saw about nclt nclat and its composition and functions now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article friends look at this article this news article talks about the discussion of national commission for women that is ncw see the discussion is regarding the criminalization of marital rape issue so in this context we will discuss about the national commission for women in prelims perspective see ncw has been consistently in use for the last couple of months that's why we have taken this article for today's discussion and you can expect a question regarding ncw in your preliminary examination 
like questions which may ask for which of the following are constitutional or non constitutional bodies and they may give ncw as one of the option so now we will start our discussion see the national commission for women was set up as a statutory body in january 1992 statutory body in the sense it is established by a statute and the statute simply means a written law so ncw is established by a parliamentary law and what is that law it is the national commission for women act of 1990 so we can conclude that ncw is not a constitutional body this is the first important takeaway and you should know why it was established right so we will discuss the purpose of the commission the first purpose is to review the constitutional and legal safeguards for women and the second purpose is to recommend remedial legislative measures and thirdly it shall facilitate redressal of grievances and finally to advise the government on all policy matters affecting women having discussed the purpose now let us see the history of this commission in brief see nearly two decades ago the cswi that is the committee on the status of women in india recommended for the setting up of national commission for women the main purpose for which it was suggested uh, to fulfill the surveillance function to facilitate redressal of grievances and to accelerate the socio economic development of women also several other committees recommended the constitution of an apex body for women that is ncw so according the national commission for women act 1990 was passed by the parliament which constituted a body known as ncw now let us see the composition of this commission see ncw consists of a chairman and he or she is nominated by the central government then the commission also consists of five members and they are also nominated by the central government and they should be amongst the persons who have experience in law or legislation trade unionism management of an industrial potential of women and women's voluntary organizations economic development health education or social welfare kindly note that at least one member each shall be from amongst person belonging to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes respectively and ncw also consists of a member secretary who is also nominated by the central government and he shall be an expert in management field or organizational structure or social movement or an officer who is a all india civil servant or a officer holding union civil post with appropriate experience see just have a look at the some of the important function of this commission why because this can be easily framed as a question in your preliminary examination and this point is important here kindly read it now let us finally see some of the important powers given to this commission kindly note that the commission while investigating any matter referred to it shall have all the powers of a civil court and powers of a civil court in the sense it can try a suit see suit is a generic term for any filing of a complaint or petition asking for legal redressal by judicial action it also has a power of summoning or enforcing the attendance of any person from any part of india and examining him or her on oath it can ask for the discovery and production of any document and it shall receive evidences on affidavits kindly note that it can request any public record or copy thereof from any court or office and the last power include the examination of witness and documents and other matter which may be prescribed and that's all regarding ncw we learned that ncw is a statutory body it was established by the ncw act of 1990 we have also discussed the composition and some of the functions of the commission and we ended our discussion with powers of ncw with this we have come to the end of our article discussion and with these key learned points we will solve some of the prelims practice question now look at the first question it is a previous year question asked in preliminary examination 2013 let me read out the question photochemical smog is a resultant of the reaction among option a nitrogen dioxide ozone and peroxyacetyl nitrate in the presence of sunlight and option b carbon monoxide oxygen and peroxyacetyl nitrate in the presence of sunlight and option c carbon monoxide carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide at low temperature and option d high concentration of nitrogen dioxide ozone and carbon monoxide in the evening see the correct option here is option a during our discussion we saw that presence of sunlight is important for photochemical smog so eliminate option c and d here 
you are left with two options additionally presence of nitrous oxide is important for photochemical smog so our correct answer is option a see here nitrogen dioxide is the primary pollutant involved in photochemical smog but this ozone and peroxyacetyl nitrate that is pan is a secondary pollutant pan is produced by reactions of nitrogen dioxide with various hydrocarbons the main source of this hydrocarbon is the volatile organic compound and peroxyacetyl nitrate is an hazardous substance and is even more toxic to plants than the ozone now let's move on to the second question it is regarding nclt which of the following are the functions of lclt statement 1 nclt can deregister a company if it has provided false information during incorporation and statement 2 nclt approval is required if a public company is converted into a private firm and which of the followings are correct you should identify the correct statement here see the first statement is correct see according to section 7 of companies act nclt can deregister a company if it has provided false information during incorporation this is a fact and the second statement is wrong because earlier the nclt used to have this power but after companies fourth amendment rules 2018 the conversion procedures of public company into a private company are now associated with regional director since statement 1 is correct 2 is wrong the correct answer is option a one only now look at the third question it is again regarding photochemical smog let me read out the question with reference to the difference between the air pollutants known as photochemical smog and industrial smog which of the following statements are correct statement 1 photochemical smog develops in colder conditions whereas industrial smog develops in warmer conditions and statement 2 photochemical smog is known as los angeles smog and industrial smog is known as london smog and statement 3 photochemical smog involves nitrogen oxides but industrial smog involves sulfur oxides you have to identify the correct statement here see here the industrial smog refers to the sulfur smog we have discussed right here statement 1 is incorrect because it should be vice versa that is photochemical smog develops in warmer conditions especially in summer whereas industrial smog develops in colder condition with high humidity so statement 1 is wrong you can easily eliminate two options you are left with two and regarding statement 2 and 3 we have discussed that photochemical smog is known as los angeles smog and industrial smog is known as london smog and photochemical smog involves nitrogen oxide but industrial smog that is sulfur smog involves sulfur oxides both are correct so our answer is option d 2 1 3 only look at the last question for our today's discussion it is regarding national commission for women Consider the following statements with reference to National Commission for Women. NCW is a constitutional body under Article 324. The second statement is NCW can take suo moto notices on deprivation of women's rights. And the third statement states that NCW can take final decision on socio-economic planning for development of women. And the fourth statement NCW can summon any person from any part of India and examining him or her on oath. Which of the following statements are correct? See, statement one here is incorrect because NCW is a statutory body. It was established under National Commission for Women's Act of 1990. See here, we have already discussed in our Hindu news analysis about Article 324. Article 324 established which commission? Kindly post it in the comment section. So option one is incorrect here. So you can eliminate option A and D. See the statement two. NCW can take so much notices on deprivation of women's rights. See, I have. told you to note this fact in its functions right this statement is correct and regarding third statement it is incorrect because ncw advise on socio economic planning for development of women but they cannot make the final decision so this statement will be incorrect regarding the fourth statement it is correct we saw this in our discussion under important powers of ncw so our final answer is option c 214 only the main questions are displayed on the screen write your answers and post it in the comment section if you like the video hit the like button post your comments and share the video and don't forget to subscribe shankar is academy youtube channel thank you